A few weeks ago, I won the live streams up here on the channel. We had a great question come through all about cramping, asking about the causes of cramping and some preventative measures. Now, I gave a bit of a response about how there isn't many known really causes of cramping. There's no set defined pattern. And that's really still what some of the research says. But I wanted to spend a bit of time going away, doing the research for you guys, bringing together some of the evidence to then give you a better idea as to why there is so, so much, I guess, misunderstanding of what actually happens with cramping and why some methods that sound like they should work in theory maybe actually don't in practice or the other way around, you actually do all the preventative work and you still cramp anyway. So that's what we're gonna break down today. Bit of a breakdown of a really good meta-analysis of the, the research, bringing it all together, hopefully gives you a bit of an understanding as to why there's still a bit of debate in the industry about cramping and the causes and the like. Hopefully get a bit out of it and yeah, let's get into it. Hey, welcome back to the channel. Nick here talking science of endurance and everything sports science in general. Thanks to everyone who's already been subscribing to the channel, but if you haven't already, please consider hitting that big red button. I think. If anything, today's gonna to give you a bit more of an idea about a really key topic that I think you're gonna be able to take a lot away from. So if you wanna keep up to date with these videos, the best way is to stay subscribed and pass this on to a friend. Share this with someone who you think needs to know more about cramping, they suffer from cramping and could benefit from understanding a bit more of the science and the information behind it. Today, as I said in the intro, is a response to a question I had on a live stream a few weeks ago asking about cramping and I gave a bit of a, a short answer in terms of there isn't really one cause, there's a number of different mechanisms and it's true because there's a number of different experiences we hear from athletes and we don't have to go too far into the research, we can just listen to athletes' experiences of cramping and our own experiences of cramping which is what we call anecdotal evidence which at the end of the day is what we call the lowest level of evidence. It's not necessarily um, scientifically based, it's just uh, I guess stories of what people have experienced which has some merit to it and it isn't by any means just we should throw it out and not even worry about it at all but it isn't put through the rigorous processes of scientific uh, research and, and, a, and a study where there is some clear steps and boxes it needs to tick to be able to prove an effect or prove that something actually occurred through a me mechanism or a preventative measure actually worked to be able to relieve things uh, in terms of cramping. So what we, what we typically hear is is it something to do with hot conditions or is it something to do with fatigue or overexertion? These are some of the things that we hear quite a lot, but what does the research actually tell us? And I just spent um, a whole bunch of time looking through some of the research and actually came across this really good meta-analysis, which is at the other end of the spectrum. I'm actually gonna find the graph and I'll put it up on the screen here of levels of evidence and a meta-analysis or, or systematic review review of the literature is the highest level. This brings together all of the research studies, summarizes it for us, brings out all of the key parts of it. So you still have to go through and check some of the, check some of the, the I guess the conclusions that they draw to make sure that they are accurately representing the studies for sure. But it is gonna be the best place to then collate all of the most relevant evidence. And this one was done in 2019, so fairly recently. So it's taking everything into consideration. Reading through this, there was some things referenced back to like the early 1900s all the way through to more modern times. So it's trying to it bring together everything we know about cramping and all of the research that has been collected. Within sport, obviously, specifically, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the occupational findings as well, because obviously we can't always do our research in sport because it may not be practical, small sample sizes that, that uh, I guess, reduce the effect of the, the study and things like that. So a few key facts that came out of this uh, in terms of who experiences cramping. We know that through a couple of the research studies that were done, some of the numbers will vary, but for triathletes, in, on the most part, a couple of studies represented up, up to about 67% of triathletes have experienced cramping. That's not will experience cramping, that is have experienced cramping. Keep that in mind. So it's not necessarily, they might've experienced it once in their life and then that's it, never again. They might've experienced it a few times. They, it doesn't take into account how susceptible they are to cramping. It just shows us generally about 67% of people report they've cramped at some point in time in terms of triathletes. And for runners, marathon runners in particular, and cyclists, grouping them together and, and combining them is uh, as a group, any, anywhere between 18% of cyclists and, and marathon runners, right up to about 70% have reported cramping, depending on the study you look at. So really what I get from this is it's quite sporadic. We can't actually pinpoint when are people cramping or how often are people cramping. It's more people have experienced it, but based on the populations we look at, we might get more or less people experience it, which then again suggests that element of randomness to it. It could happen to anyone almost, um, depending on a, a couple of factors. In terms of the, the causes though, it's hard to know the true impact of um, the impact of cramping, obviously, but it's also hard to pinpoint some of the causes because cramping is usually this spontaneous type of event. It can happen early in a race. Some, some athletes sort of report it happening quite early on. You might feel it occurring in the swim. If you're going into an Ironman triathlon, you get into the swim leg and you might get a couple hundred meters in and start to feel your, your feet cramp. 
I mean, you, that's not anything to do with dehydration or sodium loss or anything to do with overexertion. It, it's, you, you're in the first couple of minutes uh, of your event. Typically, we experience it more towards the end of events. So fatigue might be playing a factor, overexertion might be playing a factor, dehydration can start to creep in. And then even some athletes won't experience cramping at all during the race. They go into their recovery and hours post-race, they're experiencing that cramping effect or they cramp in the race, have a period of relief, and then they cramp again. So because of this, I guess, spontaneous nature of the cramping and the intensity of cramping, sometimes it's just isolated to one area and quite acute and, and short-lived. Other times, you, we might get athletes who experience almost full body cramping. Um, it, because of this randomness, it is also then hard to pinpoint what are the exact causes. It, the symptoms can be sudden. You might it, it might just be a quick onset of cramp and bang, we're gone. It might also be a little bit of lead up. You might feel some things in terms of, oh, I feel like my calf is starting to cramp. Sure enough, in a couple of minutes time, it does. This is All this variability makes it very difficult for us to then get a clear idea of what is exactly happening. In terms of some of the risk factors specifically for endurance athletes, the, the obvious ones are long duration. Um, being able to have a high amount of fatigue from just being exposed to a large amount of exercise. And when I'm talking about cramping generally here, I'm talking about exercise induced cramping. So anything that is more related to athletes rather than things like repetitive uh, tasks like writing, you might get cramping in writing. They're similar effects, but they're gonna have different mechanisms. Again, we're mainly talking about how it relates to exercise and, and particularly endurance athletes and racing. So long duration, prolonged higher intensity, or a combination of high intensity and running faster than what you've experienced in training. So it's critical you get that race specific preparation in at some point, because if you go out too hard, effectively that is one of the causes that overexertion is, can be one of the, I guess, the risk factors for cramping. In terms of terrain wise, hilly terrain has been linked. So anything that's got a bit more rolling hills compared to a dead flat course has been linked a little bit to, uh, to potentially being one of the mechanisms or factors contributing to cramping, but it isn't necessarily a massive effect. There's obviously some other things in terms of age obviously plays a bit of a factor uh, in the overall equation. Older age, typically a little bit more susceptible. A family history of cramping is a minor factor that could be there as well. Things like irregular stretching or mobility habits um, have also been linked. There's a number of these factors that could be linked. And again, adding to that randomness or that spontaneous nature of cramping uh, as, as a whole. I want to sort of point out there's a really key part of this uh, part of this meta analysis that talked about fatigue alone is the is unlikely to be a cause by itself, but it could be a contributing factor. So when we have a long duration of an event at a prolonged high intensity, we're obviously going to accumulate fatigue, but it's fatigue plus the onset of things like dehydration or a large amount of uh, a large amount of fluid loss or electrolyte loss uh, as well. Those two combined are going to create um, create that more likelihood of, of cramping rather than just fatigue or just Hydration. So it's critical to think about there's a multiple causes coming together to then lead to the outcome that we know uh, is cramping from an exercise uh, perspective. Then it comes down to, all right, what are the two key things from a research perspective? There's two real methodologies from a scientific perspective that we think might be causing cramping. The first one is a disturbance in our water and salt balance. This is the one we talk about all the time. Electrolyte intake, fluid intake, but again, mainly anecdotal evidence. It's mainly on the response of what did athletes feel like they missed out on during the race? They feel like they didn't take enough sodium in or they feel like they didn't take enough fluid in. Um, they've lost a lot. We know at the end of the race, they weigh them, weigh themselves. They've lost a lot of fluid. Okay, it's kind of, I guess, convenient that they've cramped and then we've put together some of this evidence as well. Um, largely for endurance athletes though, this is the more supported method because we are exposed to that longer period of time out there exercising. The other method is more to do with the neurological alteration resulting in what we call abnormal motor drive. I'm not gonna go into the complexity of this because I sat there for hours looking at it going, I'm still trying to get my head around it. I'm gonna keep it really simple. It's basically, uh, effectively it's coming down to a lot of the studies looking at when the muscle is shortened and then activation occurs. So typically when we contract a muscle, the muscle shortens. So I'll give you an example, the hamstring, when you bring your heel to your butt, it, essentially the hamstring shortens to allow that contraction to occur. When the hamstring's already shortened and then it gets activated again, that's a potential cause of the cramping side of things, which is probably, uh, again, is a little bit circumstantial and really the research doesn't really give us much solid insight into is that actually a cause of cramping? But it's the type of thing that that might start to explain why someone like a sprinter might experience cramping at the end of their race. It's nothing nothing to do with prolonged exposure to duration or, or hilly terrain or long fatigue, dehydration. It might be a more of a neuromuscular aspect that is happening there. So they're really the two, the two keys, but really neither of them have solid enough evidence at a high enough level to say that this is the exact cause. And that sort of leads to, I guess, maybe multiple mechanisms um, are causing cramping and 
therefore things like preventative mechanisms or preventative treatments, etc., may not be able to be uniform in their, their application. We can't necessarily say that this is the one one thing to, to solve all of your cramping issues, taking this supplement or taking sodium or any preventative strategies may be, it is going to cure all cramps. So if there's any products out there that you see that are maybe making that claim, I, I would strongly argue that it's a very misled um, guidance. It might have an influence and it might have some research uh, in terms of being able to prevent cramping, but because of this variation that we've got going on all over the place and all of these different components that I've talked through so far, it's very, very unlikely that you'd be able to follow one method and that solves all of your cramping forever. If anything, if that did was the case, if you took a supplement, if you decided sodium was the way to go, salt tablets, um, through your hydration, whatever it may be, and you never experienced cramping after that, it's probably more, I guess, a little bit of luck more than anything is what, what I'm getting at here rather than being, okay, that's the reason I've, I've solved my, my cramping. It's just kind of luck. Potentially at some point that, that luck is going to run out and you're going to cramp again. Then you're kind of back to square one, which is where a lot of athletes struggle. And I've had that conversation a number of times where athletes gone, well, this has cured my cramping in the past, but now it's not working. What do I do? It's like, well, okay, maybe it wasn't actually, you, you can't just take a one, one size fits all approach to cramping because it is so multifactorial in nature. In terms of, in terms of some of the solutions, I guess, what, what can we do though? When we look at some of these, these uh, I guess, factors combined and then the mechanisms of cramping, what are some of the things that we can do to try to get ahead of it as best we can? And really it comes down to when we're talking about the fluid and the, the water and the sodium balance, really an increased sodium intake is shown to be quite effective. But again, it's not a foolproof strategy. However, there's been some a decent number of research studies on occupational um, settings. So Particularly, there was one uh, with building the Hoover Dam in the US, hot conditions, long exposure in hot conditions, high physical amount of work for long periods of time. So similar things to what endurance athletes are expecting. I know it's a very different thing, but it's hard to get a large group of endurance athletes to go through a very controlled study. But in terms of a work site, they're able to obviously control a lot of factors because they're all doing very similar similar tasks in the same environment and they can provide uh, interventions to some, some people and not to others. They actually found in... Those who drank plain water alone, when they were losing lots of fluid as a result of sweating, that labor-intensive work, when they were losing a lot of fluid, plain water alone wasn't as effective as adding a little bit of salt to the water. So having some of that sodium, I guess, replenishment and electrolyte replenishment was actually beneficial. And it's seemingly, in that circumstance, and that's been repeated a few times, that seemingly alleviated uh, the number or the risk factors in terms of, in terms of people cramping um, fluid alone increase the, the the risk of cramping having their sodium decrease it a little bit so we can maybe draw some conclusions there that link a little bit better to an endurance athletes so plain fluid alone across the whole race is something that a lot of athletes just won't do you'll have some sort of sodium in there whether it's through a, a carbohydrate based sports drink or whether it's through your gels or you're taking it more of electrolyte based you might take salt tablets all these variations um pretty typical that you won't be taking just plain water but it, it is an easy one to maybe if someone's at more at the beginner stage and they don't really know what to take start to think about just adding a little bit of sodium in whether it's just dropping a, a sodium dissolvable tablet electrolyte tablet into your water bottle that could be a good starting point and it might actually get ahead of just put you ahead of the the curve a little bit on that path to trying to prevent as much of the cramping as possible in terms of once cramping onsets what do we do static stretching is the kind of thing that we all automatically go to and, and reach for because it has been shown again more this anecdotal or case study evidence base of static stretching being effective in acute circumstances so after we have an onset of cramping you feel the cramp happen in your calf you naturally go to try and stretch it out and we get a bit of relief there because it's some changes in the neuro neurological side of things and we get some changes to the inhibition of uh, some of the complexities in and around the muscle and the, the tensions that are going on changing that nervous system relationship again coming back to that method is it more of that neurological disturbance or is it um, is it sodium induced there is a little bit also to then talk about well that sodium uh, side of things is it throughout our blood plasma probably not it's more towards the the sodium and electrolyte balance at the cell membrane which then causes electrical impulse to come through which i talked about in the in the live stream as well as being a potential cause so that static stretching might actually help that process also um but again acute cramping it may it's not necessarily going to prevent it but it's more of a strategy once it has onset and once you're already experiencing cramping then you might consider it as just to get that instant relief help alleviate some of that that cramping symptom uh, immediately 
rest and recovery for a long term and, and getting things in in terms of fluids afterwards is obviously going to be a long term strategy, but the, the static stretching can alleviate the, that onset of symptoms and, and reduce that. Any, any particularly, if you get those really bad ones, it can be sometimes quite painful. So if you can reduce some of the pain, that's obviously going to be beneficial to you and you're going to want to do whatever you can uh, to alleviate some of that. In terms of some of what they call the folk remedies, and this is the last thing I'm going to touch on, things like pickle juice, uh, vinegar, anything that's got a strong or bitter taste is typically used um, uh, as a, I guess, one of these what they call folk remedies to to cure camp, uh, cramping or alleviate the symptoms of cramping, prevent it, etc. A lot of this, again, anecdotal, placebo, potentially based evidence. The pickle juice example is an interesting one because that gets used a lot um, and talked about a lot, endurance athletes in particular, but then also things like AFL football or soccer players have used pickle juice quite a bit and it's sort of come on the market recently over the last couple of years as being a bit more uh, aware of that. Likely the, the cause of that being beneficial is probably because of a bit of the sodium concentration within the pickle juice. The, the sharp bit of taste might have some sort of effect in terms of neurologically, um, some, some sort of stimulation there, but typically the sodium concentration is going to be the thing we're talking about. It's effective in in reducing the cramp duration. Keep in mind the study that found uh, found the effects of pickle juice being effective for reducing the cramp duration was when they were artificially stimulating the cramps. So they were using electrical impulses to cause a cramp in the first place rather than actually having an athlete and going, oh, you've cramped at the end of an Ironman. Stop where you are. I'm going to give you some pickle juice and see if it does anything. Um, so it, it is a very laboratory controlled. So we're unsure how it translates out in the field. And again, it's mainly sort of based on evidence of what people sort of found in their own experience, which isn't really enough to say that this is a genuine method to use. So by no means am I necessarily advocating for the use of pickle juice, but um, I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad thing either. We kind of, it, it could work. It, it also may not. It's that luck of the draw that I was talking about earlier. But in terms of the, the duration being reduced, it didn't reduce the intensity of the cramp though, which I would argue is probably the, the, I guess the, the more difficult part of the equation. If you have a really, really hard, like harsh cramp, particularly in your foot, if you ever pushed off a wall when you're swimming, you get that really big painful cramp in your foot. Um, I would argue the intensity is worse than the duration. Cause like I said, if you can do some static stretching and alleviate it, then it's all right. We can alleviate some of the, that we can sort of work through it. All the fouls I've, I've been in the pool before and I've just kicked with one leg to try and work around it. I can still swim. When you're out running, you might be able to still walk and just kind of walk the cramp out. Some people might have experienced that as well. A bit of static stretching, walk again, static stretch, walk. The duration is probably not not a key factor. It's the intensity that's the, the part that's going to probably cause the most pain and, I guess, interruption. So from that perspective, reducing duration of, of cramping by pickle juice might be okay. But again, is it really going to be that beneficial? Maybe, maybe not. That is a lot, I know. I know I've covered and talked for quite a bit, but it, it is a topic that I, I felt like I, I had to go through and give you that full rundown and basically break down. I'll leave the reference down below so you can go and read uh, the meta-analysis if you'd like to. Let me know your thoughts uh, on anything I've talked about here. Is there any of your experiences? Again, that anecdotal evidence is, is mainly where a lot of it is coming from. So leave your anecdotal evidence down below. Your experiences of cramping, what have you used to prevent it? But we have to consider that there is a lot of factors at play here. I've talked through so many different components that could be going into cramping. Um, we, we need to make sure that we're not just following a one-size-fits-all approach. And if you are, um, it's probably more luck more than anything else rather than it actually having a beneficial effect because the research still isn't at a point where we can actually identify clearly what is the cause of cramping. I know I've talked a lot today. I'm going to leave it there. As always, please consider subscribing to the channel. If you got something out of this video, please share it with someone you, who, someone else who you might think benefits from this. Get them to subscribe to the channel as well. The bigger we can build this community, the more we can put out in terms of content like this where we break down these big topics and take it step by step, keep it nice and simple for you guys, and hopefully you can get some practical takeaways as well. As always, keep subscribing to the channel. Looking forward to seeing you on a live stream soon. Uh, that is it for today, and we'll see you in the next one.